good morning or afternoon, evening, however I'm reaching you at this time to all of our seniors at LCC um, and also to the parents of the seniors. We are doing the FAFSA workshop a lot different than we usually do. I'm usually sitting in this auditorium full of seniors and I meet with them each and every class throughout the day, but this is the new norm for right now. So you guys bear with me and I will try and give you the best information that I have about the FAFSA and how you fill it out because actually um, you've got to get ready by tomorrow. The FAFSA actually opens up and it's open between the time of October the 1st and usually students will ask me what is the deadline. When I looked on the FAFSA website this morning, the deadline is actually June the 30th of 2021. So that is the last day that you actually can fill out the application for financial aid. One thing that I would like to say from the beginning is please make sure that whenever you fill out the FAFSA that it states that it is a free application. Because I have had in the past, a couple of students have went to that website where they do charge you. Please do not pay to fill out the application for financial aid because the application is free and it will cover all of the schools within the United States. So please do not pay for this application. Now, with the FAFSA, the FAFSA covers a couple of grants, but one of the things that I would like to talk about in the beginning is what do you need? How do you know what you need to get ready to fill out this FAFSA? And so the Department of Education provides us in financial aid with a form that says seven things you need before you fill out the FAFSA for the 2021-22 year. So with the FAFSA form, then I would like to start by saying a lot of you all are familiar already, most of the students anyway. If you've got any social media, you've already got a username and a password. Just like with those, you're going to have to have a username and a password for your FAFSA. The website that you go to to start off with your FAFSA is F as in Frank, A as in Apple, F as in Frank, S as in Stanley, and A as in Apple, .gov, fafsa.gov. When you go to that website, then the first thing that they're gonna ask you for is your username and your password. This morning, I actually tried to see if I could bypass that step. Maybe I could log in as a guest and that wasn't possible. It will ask you to go ahead and create a username and a password. And so that's fine. You will want to do that. And it takes a little bit and that's fine. But what you'll want to do, please make sure to keep note of this. Once you create your username and your password, if you forget it, you can't call me, you can't call your high school, you have to call the Department of Education. They're the only ones who will be able to unlock that information for you. Also, make sure that whenever you create your username and password, that you link it to an email that you will have even after you graduate high school. Because once you graduate high school, you won't have access to that for very long once you graduate. So make sure that you use a personal email that will really help you to be able to use this for the longevity of your college career. Once you have created your username and password, most of the students here today will actually need to make sure that their parents have a username and password also. They will need to have their own email so that it's linked to that. If you try to link it to an email already used for a FAFSA username and password, then it will kick back a message that says it's not available. So please make sure that whenever you create your username and password that you write this information down and keep it in a place where you can go to it and find out where it is so that you don't get locked out. But if you do get locked out, please make sure that you go back to the FAFSA website, call their number. They are very helpful. They will help you to be able to know how do I get this unlocked? What do I do? And so they actually will be able to help you with that. I have an important note here and I don't want to overlook it. It says, do not create a FSA ID on behalf of someone else. That means parents should not create FSA IDs for their children and vice versa. 
Doing so may result in issues signing and submitting the FAFSA form and could lead to financial aid delays. And that's obviously not something that we want. It says anyone who plans to fill out the FAFSA form should create a username and an ID as soon as possible. So this is actually something that can be created today. Where the FAFSA does open up tomorrow, this is something that you want to go ahead and get out the way. And it can be time consuming because they will ask you questions about, um, you know, what's your favorite color? They always do that. They'll ask you, what was the first car that you drove? Just in case you need to unlock it. When they call, when you call them, then they will ask you these questions. And if you know the answer, then they can unlock it. So write these things down so that you'll have access to them. And if, it, if you've had multiple cars and they ask you, what was your first car? It can get a little confusing. So write it down, have easy access to it. That is the best advice that I actually can give, especially about the FAFSA username and passwords. If you are required to provide parent information on your FAFSA form, your parents should also create one too. And we spoke about that. Because your FAFSA ID is equivalent to your signature, parents and students each need to create one. In some situations, you may need to wait up to three days to use your FSA ID. So if this is the case, please do not be alarmed. That is okay, because we're right now at the last day of September. October the 1st is the very next, is the very next day. That is the very first day that the FAFSA is actually going to be open. And that's all right. Even if you were to fill out the FAFSA at the end of October, we're still ahead of the game and that is great. So please don't be dismayed or discouraged feeling like you've waited too long. We're still ahead of the game if we're filling it out in October. So if you fill out your username and password on October the 1st and you're not able to get back into your FAFSA or create your FAFSA until 3rd, 4th, or 5th of October, that's okay. Please do not be alarmed because we're way ahead of the game and you're doing what you need to do. Something else that you will need for your FAFSA is your social security number. For most of us, this is something that's new. Being in high school, most of us don't have to know our social security number, but you will want to become familiar with that number because throughout college, I will tell you, they're gonna ask for it a lot. So you will need to know that. It says you can find the number of your social, on your social security card. If you don't have access to it and don't know, you can ask your parent or your legal guardian. Or you can contact the Social Security Administrator if you have, as myself, misplaced your Social Security card in the past. So you can get access to it if you don't have access to that card. Social Security Administration will help you just as well. Also, with the driver's license, on the FAFSA it will ask you about your driver's license. But you don't have to have it. Driver's license is not required. If you supply it, that is perfectly fine, but that is one of the only questions on the FAFSA that is not required. For this year's FAFSA, you will be asked for your 2019 tax records. In case you didn't hear about it, the changes that we've made to the FAFSA process, beginning with 2017-18 FAFSA form, we now require you to report information from an earlier tax year. This is a benefit to you guys. Most students in the past, what we've had to do is wait until January, and then even in January, your parents still have not filed their taxes yet. They have to wait until February, March, or whenever they get all of their 1040 forms. So once that form is submitted, then by that point, you feel like everybody else has been able to apply for financial aid except for me, and I'm behind. This actually places you at an advantage because your parents should have at this point already completed the 2019 taxes. So you'll have access to that at the same time as everybody else and be able to fill out the tax information. One thing that I would challenge you guys to do, if you can, go ahead and Google what a uh, 1040 is. What does it look like? Because what they're gonna ask you for is the adjusted gross income and working wages. Those two are very important. But if you don't know how to read it, then to stay ahead of the game, if you can Google it and study it, once it's time for you to fill out the FAFSA, you'll already know. And this is something that actually in the long run, even past the FAFSA, is something that we all need to be 
familiar with because as you start working, you want to know what did I make throughout the year. As an employee, you want to know where your money went to. So I would challenge you guys, if you can, go ahead and be familiar with the 1040s because it becomes very easy once you get familiar with it to work right through that FAFSA and it doesn't take long if you know what you're looking for. If something happens that you don't know what you're looking for and you need help, I'm actually going to give my information at the end of the video so that you guys can contact me and I can tell you exactly where to go and what to look for on the 1040. If it be the student or the parent, I can help either. And you don't necessarily have to be going to the college where I work at. So let me also rewind for a second because I didn't get a chance to um, tell you who I am. So that just goes to show you that I'm imperfect also. I want to take this time to introduce myself. My name is Keisha Hunt Erie, E-A-R-Y. I work at Southeast Community College and I have been there well over 12 years now. And um, I am the financial aid coordinator with Southeast and I help students, even if you are not um, attending Southeast, I make students to feel welcome to come. You can ask me questions. I help with FAFSAs. I don't get that that often, but I like to make sure that students know that they are welcome to come and into my office. And if I don't know, I don't have a problem with asking questions, okay? So then the next thing that is being asked of you on your FAFSA, records of untaxed income. It says the FAFSA questions about untaxed income may or may not apply to you. They include things like child support received, interest income, and veterans non-education benefits. On the 2021-2022 FAFSA form, you'll report your 2019 taxes or calendar year when you're asked for these questions. Also, another thing, records of your assets. Money, it's money. This section includes savings and checkings. Their balances on both of those accounts, as well as the value of investments such as stocks and bonds or real estate, but not the home in which the family lives in. So that's a very important point that you guys need to know. It is not the home that you currently live in. You should report the current amounts as of the date you signed the FAFSA form, rather than reporting the 2019 tax year amounts. Note, misreporting the value of investments is a common FAFSA mistake. You've gotta be careful with this one. It says, please be careful, review what it, what it is, and is not considered a student investment to make sure you don't over or under report you may be surprised by what you can and cannot exclude. Also, the list of schools. This is actually a pretty good one. You'll want to list the schools that you are interested in. So whenever you go onto the FAFSA, it will ask you, well, the schools that you're planning on attending, do you know what the school code is? For example, for Southeast Community College here in Kentucky, the school code is 00-1998. So you don't have to have that. You actually can look it up by city and state if you know the name. So it's very simple. You do not have to have the school code, but it makes it really simple if you do. And you can Google that also. If you go to the schools that you're planning on selecting, you should be able to go under their financial aid screen and find their school code. It says, be sure to add any college you're, you're considering, even if you haven't applied or been accepted. That's a good one too. Even if there is only a slight chance you'll apply to college, still list some schools. Fill out the FAFSA anyway. If you're not feeling like going to college right now, that may change. And by filling out the FAFSA early, then that puts you in the pool for more money. By waiting too long, a lot of money does get gone fast. So to prevent you from losing out on possible funds, go ahead and fill it out. It doesn't hurt anything. What are we doing? We're locked in due to COVID. So it says, even if there's a slight chance, fill it out. You can always remove schools later. So if you put too many, you can remove them. We do that at the college all the time. We change them around. That's not a problem. 
and it says if you decide not to apply, but if you wait to add a school, you could miss out on first come, first serve financial aid. That actually brings me to something that I do want to bring up to you because whenever students are applying, they usually just think within a small window. They ne don't necessarily think of it from the perspective of, well, I may want to go to a private school. And by listing a private school, you actually make yourself open to private money. There is funds that private schools receive that we do not that at schools that are not private. So you'll want to make sure, at least list one. And so by doing that, you, if you list Berea, U Pike, or Alice Lloyd, and you don't have no intentions of going, it's okay. But what you'll want to do, at least list one of those. Because that means, okay, well we can put them, their name, in a pool for money that we have at our college that other colleges may not. So that is something that is very important. At least list one. And that may not even be something that you're even considering. Like I said, you may not even be considering going to college. And that's okay. And it's not going to hurt a thing by at least filling out the application. Okay? It also says the school you list on your FAFSA form will automatically receive your FAFSA. I will tell you, in financial aid, it does take a couple of days. Once you fill out this FAFSA, it usually takes about five to seven days if you're just filling it out for the first time. If you make a change to it, you've already filled it out, we've received it, but you go in and add another school, then that change usually takes probably about three to five business days, whereas the original application takes five to seven. So it can take a couple of days for us to get it, but do not be discouraged. One of the things that you are actually going against, if you fill it out once classes start and you don't fill it out now, is that waiting period. That's something that you don't want because usually students are ready to get their books, they want to have everything taken care of, but if you wait to fill out your FAFSA until after classes start, then there is a great chance that not only do you have to wait that five to seven business days to get your books, you could also be selected for a process called verification. With verification, they want to verify that you are who you are. They want to verify that the income you put on your FAFSA is correct. So with that being said, you want to have all of this stuff taken care of. If you've got to provide extra information to the college, you could already have this stuff taken care of and be set and ready to go by the time classes start. So filling the FAFSA out early is a great thing. Also, it says that you can list up to 10 schools at a time on your FAFSA form. If, you, if you're applying to more than 10 schools, here's what you should do. And you go to, that, uh, to this website. It is studentaid.gov forward slash sa forward slash help forward slash more dash 10 dash colleges. So then if you're planning on applying to more, that website will help. And you can find that listed also on the FAFSA website. So if I went too fast, that's okay. Once you go to the FAFSA website, that link is right there. Okay? So it says, as a tip, to, consider, to be considered for state aid, several states require you to list it in a particular order. So if you know for a fact that you're going to go to UPIKE, you'll want to put them first. Put them right at the top. And then the ones that you're least considering, put those down toward the bottom. But you can go up to 10. If you need to go up to more, that website will help you. All right. And so it says, ready to start. Once you're ready, you have several ways to complete your FAFSA form, including FAFSA.gov. And the website is also available on the mobile app. A lot of students, most of us now, do everything on our phones. And so as students here, most of the students, whenever they're here, they, you can tell they, everybody here has got a cell phone. You actually can do it by your cell phone. So they have made it to where it is cell phone friendly. You can do it and fill it out. If you don't feel comfortable, you can always do it on a computer. It's not a problem, but it is a plus that they have added that feature of it being available by the app. 
Okay, so some things that they don't talk about that I would like to go over with you today. Whenever you're filling out the FAFSA, you fill out the FAFSA and it makes you eligible for the Pell Grant, which is currently at $3,173 per semester. That amount is if you are full time. So then to be full time, you are 12 credit hours or more. But that amount does change per household because whenever you fill out a FAFSA, the FAFSA is based on the number of people in the household and the amount of income that you provided. So usually I'll have students that'll say, well, somebody else that has the same situation as mine got a different amount. Then their situation couldn't possibly be the same as yours. So what I would ask is if you can try and stay away from the comparison game because your situation, chances are, is a lot different than your neighbors. So, and if you feel like you made a mistake, you can always, once the FAFSA's been processed, you can always go back into it. Once you receive that email saying your FAFSA has been successfully processed, you can go back into it to see, did I put too many people in the household? Did I list myself twice? Did I actually put the correct amount of income down for myself and for my parents? Because if you're working and your parents are working, it could very well ask you for your information from your tax information also. But you want to make sure to list this correctly. So back to the Pell, the Pell Grant, the current amount is $3,173. And as I said earlier, that is per semester if you are full time, 12 credit hours or more. Now, what if you are 11 credit hours? In that instance, the amount is adjusted accordingly. So then, once you, if you look at your financial aid and you're like, well, I thought that she said on the video, 3173. But you also have to look at how many credit hours that you are enrolled in. If you are only taking six credit hours, the cost of your attendance is not going to be the same as someone who's in 12 credit hours. So the Department of Education will pay you accordingly. Okay? Pell Grant has a limit. This is also something that is very important also. Um, you can receive the Pell Grant until you have received your first bachelor's degree or after six years of receiving full financial aid. So which will ever one that comes first is the one that's going to apply to you. But there is a cap on how much Pell Grant that you actually can receive. And they now call that lifetime eligibility. For students that have received Pell Grant for up to 12 semesters or once you get your first bachelor's degree, then at that point you become a loan only student. The FAFSA also covers the SEOG grant and the CAP grant. CAP grant is currently at $1,000 per semester if you're 12 credit hours. That's another one that's adjusted down. Last time I checked, the SEOG is around $500. And so usually I don't see that one get adjusted, but if you want to know for sure, you can always contact me and I can dig a little bit further. But I usually don't see that one get adjusted very often. And then we already talked about the fact of making sure that you put down a private school. I really can't stress that one enough. That one is really, really important because you want to make sure you're applying for every little bit of money that you possibly can get. Now, something that I do want to talk about is I touched on a loan just a second ago. And one of the things that I would challenge people to do um, is if we get to that point where you fill out a FAFSA and you know for a fact I'm not going to get financial aid or if you try to bypass it. I've had that too. Students will say I'm, I'm not really interested in filling out the FAFSA. I'm just not going to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and fill out a loan. Well, I do need to let you know that in order for you to get a FAFSA, for them to make the determination of how much you're eligible for, a FAFSA is required in order for you to get a loan. So you will want to make sure, fill out that loan application so that 
if something happens that you need to go that route and get that student loan, make sure to fill out that FAFSA so we can go ahead and get that out the way and then they can go ahead and give you what you're eligible for on the loan. With student loans, what we try to make sure is to educate students on making sure to borrow wisely. Um, I know that for myself, I usually give my testimony that in college, I borrowed, which was a requirement. And student loans are actually a wonderful resource when you borrow wisely. Borrowing what you need to take care of the cost of attendance, being that the co not, not just your books, not just your tuition, but are you going to be able to live comfortably throughout the semester? Are you going to be able to eat? Are you going to be able to pay your light bill? Take care of child, child care? This is also something that is considered in your cost of attendance when you're going to college. They take, they, they take that into consideration. They look at that. But then when we are looking at it from the perspective that a friend told me to take it out so that I can go on vacation, then we get into a dangerous area. So one thing that we try hard is to educate students on how to borrow wisely. If this is something that you are planning on doing, or like myself, you have to do, then make sure that you have looked at what is it going to cost me for the fall and the spring to attend. And if you're going to take out money for the summer, take out what is necessary. I do remember that in college, that when I was taking out student loans, my mother always preached to me and said, just take out what you need to. And needless to say, that actually was not my mentality. But I will tell you that whenever you're taking out student loans, if you do it wisely, you actually can prevent taxes being taken, when you get ready to file your taxes, if you owe the Department of Education any money, this money can be taken from you. And also, if you owe them any money, then you also can get your paycheck garnished. So that means they take a portion of your paycheck. The Department of Education is very easy to work with. I actually have had a lot of students come in and see me. We will, uh, I will put the phone on speaker because I can't speak on your behalf. But we will call the Department of Education up and explain the situation. Right now I'm having a hardship. Is there anything that you all can offer me? Whenever life does happen, there is always a way to fix it if we can hit it head on. And so to prevent that from happening, what I challenge you guys to do is even now, you can go to studentloanswithans.gov and you can do the entrance counseling. Just look at it, take you that quiz, figure out what is it that I'm going to be facing. On this, on this quiz, they actually will talk about interest rates. What is the difference between a subsidized and an unsub loan? I call them the good and the bad loan. One of those loans, and I'm gonna challenge you to figure out which one by doing the quiz, one of those, the interest is paid while you're in school. The other one, as soon as it hits your pocket, that interest starts. So you've got a good and a bad. Sometimes we don't necessarily have to take out all the bad. If we do, how can we stay ahead of that? The entrance counseling will give you all the information that you need, but I just challenge you guys, make sure that you borrow wisely. So most of us want to know how do we become independent so that we don't have to use our parents information and so whenever you're on the FAFSA then it will trigger you and start asking you questions so basically we need to know are you 24 yet most of us graduating high school we're not there yet as of today are you married do you have children another good one is do you have your master's degree are you currently serving active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces? Are you a veteran? That's a good one. Do you have children? And then also, at any time since you turned 13, were both of your parents deceased or in foster care? Now, I do want to stop right there and talk about foster care a little bit because um, a lot of people want to know 
you know, well, if they weren't in foster care, but they were a ward of the court, one way that I can confidently tell you is if you answer that any of these apply to you, to make sure that you're on track, have documentation. That is the best way that you can back up what you're, what you're saying. Because if you say that you're, you've been in um, foster care or ward of the court, you will have documentation of that. So if you get selected for verification, saying that you answered the FAFSA correctly, or if you're asked for proof of this right here, you've already got it. So what I would do is if you are not able to provide, that's the easiest way that I can answer it. If you are not able to provide documentation of answering yes to any of these, that probably does not apply to you. With foster care, you're gonna have proof. You're gonna have legal documentation. Also with the ward of court, you will have documentation and be able to, pro to provide our office with what we need to show proof that that is the case for your situation, okay? And then also it says, does someone other than your parent or step parent have legal guardianship of you? Same thing. If you answer yes to that, you will have legal documentation. If you go to the doctor and somebody else has custody of you or is responsible for you, they have to provide that information at the hospital. So you will have legal documentation showing that my aunt is taking care of me. And you'll be able to provide that to them so you'll also be able to provide that to the financial aid office. And then also, at any time during this year, did your high school or school district homeless liaison determine that you are or were an unaccompanied youth who was homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? By answering yes, that means that you provide, you'll be able to provide a form from the high school stating that yes, at one point you were homeless. And they will send a form and usually with my office that is enough. Some offices may require more and that is okay. They have to make sure that they are covered for auditing reasons. Whenever you provide us with this information, in order for us to receive federal funds, we have to have all of the documentation required by the Department of Education. So if you're asked for more funds, please don't, or more information, please do not feel like you are being picked on. We want to make sure that we serve you properly and we are able to continue to provide this service. But if we're not getting the information from you that the Department of Education requires, we won't be able to continue to provide financial aid. And that would be all schools. This also says that if you are a dependent student you, and you will need your parents' social security number, you will need their date of births, You'll need to know the month and year that they were married, divorced, or widowed. If your parents are divorced, you will need to provide the parents' information that you live most of the time with. If they have joint custody of you, then you can provide either information. Okay? So, as I stated earlier, I am going to provide my information. My name is Keisha Hunt Erie, E-A-R-Y. First name is K-E-I-S-H-A. My direct line to the college is 606-589-3330, and that's to Southeast Community College in Whitesburg, Kentucky. If you all need anything from me, please contact me. If you have any questions about the foster care program, there is actually a waiver for students that have been in foster care. And I've known a lot of students to actually miss out on these benefits. Please, please make sure to use these benefits because they are there for students such as yourself. If you have questions about those, please call Margaret Fugit on the Whitesburg campus. Her telephone number is 606-589-3319. I bid you guys a great year. I hope that you guys get everything that you need out of this year, and I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Again, my name is Keisha Hunt Erie. Please let me know if you need me. Thank you, guys.